Moving on to our next set of works in the global contemporary part of the curriculum. So this next piece is called Summer Trees by Song Sunan. Um, what you'll notice is that this is a very traditional medium and subject matter. We have a landscape of trees. You can see the bush part of the trees. They kind of look like these massive cypresses and the little trunks at the very bottom. The title is really helping us to inform us of the subject matter of this piece. So Sunam was the leader of the ink wash painting movement, which emerged during the 1980s as kind of this parallel movement to the literati, which emerged in China around a thousand years prior. So you'll notice a lot of similarities between that movement and this one, particularly in the use of ink wash painting, as well as the subject matter of creating these colossal images of nature. So much like with the literati, um, in this sense, the, pa the painter is somebody that is highly educated and respected in their community, um, alluding to this, literal, this literati ideology, which talks about like the life of harmony, nature, and beauty, rather than this focus on power and money and creating artwork for selling and buying. So Song Sunam was actually traditionally um, educated in oil painting, but he found that it was not really a medium that he could access and express his Korean identity with. So he um, transitioned back to ink wash painting to create these works. So basically a lot of the the trees in this image are created using this technique called wet on wet. So basically you are soaking the paper in water and then you are laying down these large brush strokes of ink which create these kind of like fuzzy fields on the end. What I suppose he then did was then let that dry and then put on these drier layers of ink wash on top creating these rougher edges. So it creates this highly abstracted image, but it's still recognizable as this image of a forest of tall and thin trees. So in this particular case, a group of trees can symbolize a group of friends or good character, stability. What you'll notice is that the piece is extremely balanced, it's simple, it's serene. Uh, it, it's almost reminiscent of a forest in the winter time. There's also this sense of space that's being created. You have some trees in the foreground that are larger and darker, and then the lighter strokes in the background are suggesting that there's perhaps more trees extending backward into a forest. So here's a couple of other pieces by Song Sunam. You'll again notice this um, overarching theme of creating these tall, thin trees. Here's a less abstracted piece that he created in the 60s. Moving on. So this piece is called Androgen 3 by Magdalena Abakanowicz. So Magdalena Abakanowicz was a Polish artist that came of age during World War II. She was brought up in a very well-to-do and noble family and things basically made a turn for the worst um, during the start of World War II. A bunch of Nazis actually came into her home and shot her mother's arm off when she was just a child. So that was one thing that affected her life um, in terms of the kinds of works that she created. So she had to flee her family's estate to Warsaw in Poland where she went to art school and she pursued um, the medium of textiles. She was not really about the socialist realism movement that was happening at the time. You'll recall from the Chairman Mao piece that socialist realism was this movement that was basically the, the movement that centered around the creation of propaganda for the Communist Party. So that was a subject that was pretty heavily emphasized in the two-dimensional arts, as you can imagine. Pretty much all drawing and painting was for that cause. So that's one of the reasons that she switched to textiles, is that that was something that had not really been assessed or accessed by the social realism movement. So um, Abakanowicz was known for creating these headless and sometimes limbless figures out of burlap. So during 
the social realism movement, there wasn't a lot of free material around for artists to use. Um, things were in particularly short supply and artists didn't really necessarily have a lot of space to work with. So she oftentimes used materials that were just readily available to her um, in the 40s and 50s. And this trend continued um, after, even after this period had ended. So the figures are basically created by taking burlap, which is this rough ro woven cloth, dipping it in resin, which is this material that is basically like a um, like a, a shiny finish that is sometimes used in woodworking. And when you dip the burlap in resin, that would create a hard and rigid surface. So she would dip this burlap in resin and then press it into these molds to retain the shape. So when you look at the other side of the sculpture, you can see that it's actually hollow rather than being completely solid as it might seem from this angle. So it's this one sheet of burlap dipped in resin that's been pushed into a mold here. So the figures are oftentimes associated with the dehumanization and lack of individuality that Abakanowicz perceived was a result of the communist government and its influence. Um, you will oftentimes see groupings of sculptures where you're having this similarly posed figure repeated several times. And there's this notion of like, we have this repeated figure, but there's still a sense of individuality in them. When you look, more closely, these figures have like slight variations in terms of their silhouettes and in terms of the, the way that the burlap has been pushed into the mold. So the wooden poles in this particular sculpture serve as surrogate legs. They indicate that the figure is not particularly complete on its own. This alluded to Abakanowicz's time as a nurse during World War II. She um, saw and helped treat many war victims, many of whom lost limbs. Uh, there is also the event with her own mother getting her arm shot off by the Nazis. So there's a sense of kind of like hollowness and emptiness that is being alluded to. So Abakanomics also created these massive hanging tapestries, oftentimes using, again, the same kind of burlap material as well as dyes. Again, there, was, there were lots of limits in terms of how much space and how, what kinds of materials that artists could use at this time. So a lot of these pieces could actually be folded up and stored to conserve her space. This is a great video giving some context about Abakanowicz's life. It also shows a bunch of her other works, if you would like to take a look. Our third piece of the day is called A Book from the Sky by Xu Bing. So Xu Bing was born, raised, and trained as an artist in China, but he emigrated to the United States in 1990. One of the reasons that he ended up emigrating was because a lot of his artwork was not received particularly well by the Chinese government. This particular piece was called Bourgeoisie Liberation in Beijing, where it was originally displayed, um, and it was allegedly subversive in its meaninglessness. So basically, whatever you do, the government's going to come after you. So this particular piece consists of these 400 hand-printed books, as well as these hanging scrolls um, that are coming from the ceiling. There's also material that's been posted on the walls. Um, basically, at this point in time, at, at the time when he was um, kind of like coming up as a, a teenager, if the government noticed that you had an aptitude in calligraphy or in drawing, then they would basically send you to this school camp where you learned how to create pop propaganda art for the Chinese Cultural Revolution. So he was enlisted in that program. And one of the things that he noticed is that there was this ubiquity in propaganda. It was everywhere. And he has this notion of like after a while, like when something is so omnipresent, when it's everywhere, then it doesn't have meaning anymore. I'm reminded of like the fact that I leave notes around the house 
and then after a while I don't even like process what's on those notes anymore and then I end up forgetting my like the intention of like writing the notes in the first place. So he um, created these works using movable type. So this method of movable type to create these books existed in China long before the Gutenberg press in Europe. And what's interesting is that all 4,000 of the characters that were used to create this work are nonsense. To a Western audience, they look Chinese, but they don't actually translate to anything meaningful. So again, you, we have this sense of like the omnipresence of something, but it lacks meaning. So this is a great video um, that talks about Zhu Bing and his philosophy, if you want to take a look. Here's a couple of other pieces by Zhu Bing. You'll notice in this piece on the left here that we're having imagery of the Great Wall of China. It's called Ghosts Pounding the Wall. And in this particular piece, it's a massive phoenix, um, which is an animal that is present pretty frequently in Chinese mythology made out of trash. So lots of social commentary in these kinds of works. Our final work of the day is Pink Panther by Jeff Koons. This piece is always interesting to cover with students. I'm kind of sad that I don't get to see your facial expressions and reactions in real time as you're seeing this piece. Um, it's always a treat for me every year. So this piece is the brainchild of Jeff Koons, who you may or may not have heard of. He is responsible for these massive balloon dog sculptures that you've probably seen. So this was part of a series that was initially dis displayed in the late 80s as a, that was called the Banality. So there was this exhibit that was exhibited in New York, Chicago, and Cologne, France, all simultaneously. So there were three copies of each statue made to facilitate this massive exhibition. So banal is a word that is used to describe something so lacking in originality that it's boring. So much of the aesthetic and subject matter of this series harkens back to the 1960s. The sculptures are extremely shiny and cheap looking. They resemble kitschy figurines at this massive scale. So to make matters worse for this sculpture, it is life-sized. It's the worst thing ever. I hate it. I know I'm not allowed to have an opinion about these kinds of things, but I hate it. So. Basically, um, the 1960s, as you'll recall, was this time when mass producing items was particularly popular. You'll recall with Andy Warhol's work, we have this commercialization of people and of objects. You'll recall also William de Kooning's Woman, I, Woman One, that piece where he's re referencing commercialization and these like pinup models that to him look particularly menacing. So as a postmodern artist, Kuhn's goal is to provoke. So remember Marcel Duchamp and Fountain, that overturned urinal. So critics love to hate Kuhn's. I love to hate him as well because his art seems to celebrate and benefit from pop culture and mass media. Whereas the typical postmodern artist works to subvert that message. So while a lot of artists reject that kind of like pop culture and media aesthetic. Jeff Koons is like, what if I just take it and run with it? So the female figure, as you'll notice, is in text it's been described as overly idealized. This is obviously a product of the male gaze, um, but it's overemphasized, I suppose, to the point of looking fake. Um, both of the figures represent these existing entities. Jane Mansfield was a popular Hollywood starlet at the time, and the Pink Panther is a cartoon character that you're probably familiar with. So it's a bit difficult to see in this particular view, but Jane Mansfield is topless, and she is hugging this life-sized figure of the Pink Panther. So the other works in the Banality collection echo the sense of cringeworthy sentimentality and kitsch at a large scale. 
So Jeff Koons was actually a Wall Street guy. I'm absolutely not surprised by this. And he noticed that like people in Wall Street would pay obscene amounts of money for art as long as people talked about it. So he basically switched careers and started creating these artworks that, again, are inspiring people to talk about them. Like, how could you look at this and not want to talk about it? And getting gazillions of dollars for them. So this is a great video right here that was produced by Sotheby's um, in 2011 when one of these sculptures went up for auction. Um, again, like the, a kind of sculpture like this was auctioned off for, for somewhere in the millions of dollars. So this guy, like as much of a slime ball as he is, he really knows what he's doing. So you've probably seen works like this in the Broad as well in Los Angeles. So this was another work from the Banality series. Again, you're involving this pop culture figure um, in this particularly cringe-worthy like color palette and arrangement. It looks like one of those figures that you would see in your grandma's house. But again, it's life size. And I hate that. I absolutely hate that. But again, this video is a gem. You will laugh your butt off at like the, the sincerity with which they're talking about the sculpture. There's also like elevator music in the background. It's a trip.